everybody. Today we're going to take a look at how Mendelian principles do not apply to all inheritance. Uh, it'd be very simple if we could say that everything in nature um, is follows the rules of having dominant alleles and recessive alleles and the dominant is expressed and the recessive isn't. But unfortunately nature is a lot more complex than that. So we're going to take a look at a number of examples today where the phenotypes and genotypes uh, that come out of a particular cross do not follow the same rules as Mendel's laws. So what we'll look at today are when we have um, alleles that are not completely dominant or recessive, when a particular gene has more than two alleles, and then lastly, when a single gene produces multiple phenotypes. Let's go ahead and get started. So first we'll take a look at multiple allelic traits. And what that means is you have more than one allele that codes for something. So about 100 years ago, a man named Carl Landsteiner, he discovers that there are four blood types in humans. Now, of course, this is going to help quite a bit when you are performing a transfusion for someone who has lost a lot of blood. Um, what would typically happen is, you know, if they were in the point where they needed blood to be transfused into them, they had to be in some kind of accident where huge quantities of blood were lost. And so they'd stop at nothing and they'd go ahead and they'd pump any type of blood into the patient in the hopes of saving him or her. But what we saw was that often that would result in killing the patient because putting a, the wrong blood type in a patient can actually cause uh, worse things to happen than if you hadn't have transfused it at all um, because the patient's immune system will go ahead and attack that blood you've just put in them. So every, you know, depending on the population and where it occurred at, possibly every one out of four you might have actually helped someone where three out of four the transfusion itself was the reason for the death. So um, I guess we could just mention forensics as well. You know, if a perpetrator left blood, uh, blood spatter at the scene of a crime, you could then do some rule outs based on what the criminal or the perpetrator left at the crime scene and what his or her blood type was as well. If there was a match, you could then scrutinize that perpetrator more than if it didn't match. and might be able to clear some potential uh, perpetrators um, for that specific crime. So after more research was done, uh, the human blood groups were found to be controlled by three alleles. Commonly, we know those as A, B, and O. Officially, though, how we'll look at them um, in terms of when we do Punnett squares is I with an A superscripted, I with a B superscripted, and then lowercase i. This one will represent O, this one will be the B, and this one will be the A. So. If any trait is a consequence of three or more alleles, we'll consider that a multiple allele gene. So here in our table, we see phenotype versus genotype. So again, phenotype is the trait that is expressed outwardly. Genotype is the actual alleles that code for that phenotype. So if we take a look at genotype, and here we have the homozygous dominant version. We have I superscripted A, I superscripted A. And then we also have the heterozygous condition, which is I superscripted A followed by the lowercase i. Both of these are going to uh, result in the phenotype of a person having A blood. As you can see, the IA allele is dominant over the lowercase i. With a B-blooded individual, you have IB, IB twice in the homozygote. and the heterozygote, you have IB, lowercase i, again, B being dominant over I. Well, how can you have two dominant genes? Well, we can see it in the next example. If someone was to have AB blood, their phenotype is AB, that means that they have a combination of IA and IB, and both of them are being expressed. So what that means is they are this word down here, co-dominant. They each express themselves. Now, of course, there's one last phenotype where you have O blood, and O can only be a homozygous recessive of lowercase, lowercase i. So in a co-dominant type of situation, you have two dominant alleles that can both be expressed at the same time. Now, scientifically, what do those actually code for? What, what's the difference between an A-blooded person and a B-blooded person? Well, if you take a look at the bottom, you can see what's going on here. Our red blood cells are covered with surface proteins and surface carbohydrates. Um, they function in recognition 
often inside of the immune system. So in the case of an A-blooded person, they have what's called an antigen sticking off the surface of their cell. You can see it down here. And you can see it kind of has that wavy pattern, um, how the artist here is trying to depict the A antigen. Now, do they actually look like that? No, they look different. But the artist is going to show you that a certain type of antibody is going to be trying to find that A antigen. But if you look at an A person's blood, you'll notice not only do they have the A antigen off the surface of the red blood cells, but they have B antibodies floating around. So that jagged pattern here, that sawtooth pattern, wouldn't really fit well over the A antigen. And that's going to help, which you'll see in a minute. Now, a B-blooded person, they are going to have a B antigen sticking off the surface of their red blood cells. And as you can see, it's depicted here as this jagged shape. Okay. Now, floating around in the plasma of a B-blooded person, you're going to have A antibodies, which have that wavy type appearance. So what this means is that if you have A blood, you have B antibodies whose job is to patrol around your blood looking around for any B antigens. It doesn't want to find them there because if it does, it's going to go ahead and clump up that blood, which will eventually hurt you. So B antibodies is kind of like your patrol system looking out for B blood. Your body doesn't want the two types of blood to mix. If you're B blooded, you have A antibodies floating around looking for A antigens. If it finds A antigens, it's going to bind them up. So these antigens of uh, these antibodies will fit right over, in this case, the same shape, like a lock and a key, of what we find um, on the A antigen. So antibodies and antigens will then bind together, and on the other side, you can see another red blood cell could fit over here and be bound up as well. Okay. Once you've put enough blood of the wrong type into a person, it's going to cause bad things to happen. They're going to clump up inside blood vessels, not allowing blood, uh, red blood cells to reach other parts of the body, and that's going to be very damaging to tissues downstream. Now, if you are uh, a rare enough case to have AB blood here in the United States, it's our lowest uh, blood type, lowest percent of blood type in our citizens, you actually have both A and B antigens sticking off the surface of your red blood cells. So you have the jagged B antigen and then you have the wavy A antigen. But look around in the plasma here. There's nothing. Because if either one was there, it would bind up the, the person's own blood. And of course, that would be bad. Then the last blood type, which is most common in the U.S. population, is blood type O. And if you look at their red blood cells, there's nothing on the surface of the blood cell. It's kind of bare. Now, is that wholly true? Well, as far as the antigens of blood type, there aren't any sticking off the surface. There are other antigens sticking off the surface, which we'll discuss later when we get into the immune system. But in the plasma of an O person's blood, you have both A antibodies and B antibodies. So they're patrolling looking for either A, B, or AB blood. They don't. Uh, if you're O-blooded, you don't want to see AB or AB blood mixed with your own. Okay, so uh, let me clear up the mess off the screen here, and um, here's another view that shows the shapes a little bit better. Here's an A-blooded person. Their anti-B antibody has this round cup shape, whereas a B-blooded person here has the Y-shaped antibody. So, of course, the Y would fit over the spike of that A antigen, and the cup shape would fit over the knobs of the B antigen. So again, A and B blooded people, you do not want your blood, your blood to mix. And then A, B blood, you can see you have both of them sticking off the surface of your cell and no antibodies floating in your plasma. And then if you're blood group O, you have both the anti-A and anti-B antibodies floating around, but the surface of your cell course is clean. There's no antigens sticking off of here that are going to react with those antibodies. If you take a look at this graph on the top left of the screen, you can see differences in populations in terms of what blood type and percent that each group has. For example, U.S. Caucasian population, you have about equal amounts of O-blooded uh, individuals and A-blooded individuals, the vast majority of our population. B-blooded people make up about 10% and that rare blood type of AB is about 4% or less. 
Um, this percent can change um, as people come into the country and people leave the country and there's interbreeding amongst different populations. Of course, those numbers can and do change. Uh, U.S. African Americans, for example, you have 47% O, which is about the same as Caucasian, but you have 28% A blood, which is significantly lower than that of U.S. Caucasian population. However, the B-blooded um, population of U.S. African Americans is about double that of B-blooded Caucasians. And AB blood is about the same in both. Then we can take a look at other populations, African Pygmies, African Bushmen, Australian Aborigines, pure Peruvian Indians. All kinds of different numbers exist. A lot of these numbers are... Um, uh, the, the geography of the area can play a part, or whether there's rules or not, there can be interbreeding with other populations. Look at the pure Peruvian Indians. 100% are O-blooded, 0% AB or AB. So they probably have uh, very strict guidelines that there's to be no interbreeding with other populations. Now, if you take a look at my bottom graphic here, you can see that um, you have a bunch of arrows, and they all seem to be stemming from the O. And if you read the little prompt there, it says people with blood group O are called universal donors, and people with blood group AB are called universal receivers. Why? Well, if you remember what the red blood cell was for an O-blooded individual, it was just a red blood cell with no antigens on its surface that deal with blood type. So what that means is that there's nothing really to react with with A-blooded people, B-blooded people, or AB-blooded people. If you remember, a was always on the lookout for B, so there were anti-B antibodies. B people were always on the lookout for A, so they had anti-A antibodies. Now, in the case of AB, there were no antibodies floating around because it would react with itself. Well, what that means is that if you're O-blooded, you can give to any one of these three individuals here. So, in this case here, the universal receiver is going to be the AB blood. It can receive not only from the O, but it can receive from the A because, again, no antibodies, and it can receive from B because there's no antibodies. So AB is our universal receiver, and O can donate to any of the three because of the bare surface of blood type antigens um, on the outside of the red blood cell. If you want to play around a little bit with a fun game, uh, go to NobelPrize.org, find the educational section. Um, probably the number one most popular game on there is the blood typing game where you can save or kill patients. Go ahead and give it a try if you have some time. Okay, our next topics are going to be incomplete dominance and incomplete penetrance. All right, so... Here we go. This is how we get away, once again, from Mendelian genetics. We just saw it with codominant alleles in multiple allele situations, but we can also see incomplete dominance, where it's kind of there, but also kind of not there. So the first thing that we'll look at here is a cross between a white snapdragon and a red snapdragon. Okay, Now, these are not pea plants. These are snapdragon plants. And what happens when you mix the two of these, when you breed two parental generations, instead of getting all red, as we would have gotten Mendel's F1 generation, we get all pink. It goes back to that whole blending idea that got thrown out because of Mendel's findings. But remember, Mendel's findings weren't looked at for 30 years once um, it matched with other researchers' research. So in this case here, we do have some places where we see the blending idea uh, come through and incomplete dominance is one of those places. So here all of our big R, little r combinations wind up with pink phenotypes. Now if we cross two F1s what we get is a uh, big R, big R, this would be our homozygous dominance, so the red comes back. Half of our offspring would be the big R, little r. Uh, heterozygous, and then little r, little r, white comes back right here, um, kind of like we saw with uh, Mendel's peas, where we had white come back in the F2, but we didn't have an intermediate pheno phenotype at that time. Um, if we were dealing with Mendel's laws, these two would also be red here and here, and they're not. If you test cross one of these F1 individuals with um, an RR, lowercase r, lowercase r, white snapdragon, we'll go back to the uh, characteristic half and half outcome for um, a hybrid and a recessive homozygote.
Incomplete penetrance is a little bit different as well. So sometimes you can have a dominant allele that just doesn't get expressed in the population as much as you think it would. So in the case of this hand over here, you can clearly see there's uh, one too many fingers, um, depending on how you look at it, and it's called polydactyly. And uh, what happens is, although it's a dominant allele that codes for this, not many, not a high percentage of the population actually has it, even though a dominant allele codes for it. What that means is that the allele doesn't penetrate throughout the population. Instead, the penetrance percent is very low, and very few people will wind up having polydactyly, even though their alleles code for it. And that's what we call incomplete penetrance. Here's just another look at our uh, flower crosses, where we get an intermediate phenotype. And of course, the pink is something we said that uh, typically only the blending hypothesis would produce. But in the case of uh, these pink flowers, it would be incomplete dominance. The next condition we'll look at is called pleiotropic effects, and that's when a single gene affects multiple phenotypic traits. And what we'll do is we'll highlight a disease um, where it will show pleiotropic effects because of one gene that is tr uh, changed. So sickle cell anemia occurs when a person inherits two abnormal genes, one from each parent, that cause their red blood cells to change shape. And as you can see in this lot here, you have many that are normal shape, but you have many that are sickle shape. Normally, these are red blood cells are flexible and round. However, if a person has the disease, what we'll see is that some of their blood cells will go sickle shaped and they'll be rigid and they'll be curved and we call them uh, sickles because they look like the end of the farm tool that has the half round blade. Now, this particular condition is coded by, a re uh, by an allele that is HBS and you can see it down here. And the normal allele is going to be HBA. Well, what's the HBL about? Well, that's hemoglobin. As you know, hemoglobin is a protein that's inside of all red blood cells, and it's the same protein that's going to carry the oxygen for us. So if you get an HBA, you have the normal allele. But remember, you have to get two for each trait that we have. So there's a possibility you could be HBA, 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 HBS, or HBS, HBS. The people who wind up getting sickle cell anemia uh, that code for sickle cell anemia are going to be HBS, HBS. What's going to happen is they're going to change shape, like we said, turn into this sickle cell, and that's going to make a bunch of different things happen. They're going to clump together, they're going to become sticky, stiff, fragile, and eventually that shape is going to lead to some of the problems that it causes. So one of the problems that it does cause is this. As these red blood cells are trying to get through very narrow vessels, it's going to reach a vessel called a capillary and sometimes arterioles where that half moon, that sickle shaped cell is going to start jamming up. We just said that they get sticky, they clump together, and if you jam up a blood vessel, what's going to happen is anything waiting for oxygen downstream is not going to get it and that's going to result in pain and it's going to result in possibly the death of tissue. So the vessel must be big to have them kind of flow through um, uninhibited. But if not, we're going to see some jam ups in areas where we shouldn't see jam ups. In this uh, artist rendition of, of the trait of sickle cell, you can see that each one of these parents um, is carrying both the normal, the HBA, which is just denoted with the A, and uh, also the S. And what that means is that each one of these parents are carriers. Okay, so there's the allele. And due, uh, due to Mendel's law of segregation, we know that in each case, one of the alleles is donated to an offspring. So this baby here gets the normal allele from each parent. Uh, this baby here is getting uh, one of each. It's getting the HBA from mom, the HBS from dad. This individual here, this baby, is getting the A from dad and the HBS from mom. And then lastly, this baby here is getting the S from mom and the S from dad. So in this case here, this baby here is going to have full-blown sickle cell disease. Whereas mom and dad, these are carriers as well as these two children are now carriers. This baby here does not have the sickle cell and, uh, allele 
uh, combination in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so what is the cause of sickle cell anemia? What, when we get down to it, why do some people get it? Well, the science behind it is that the DNA code is slightly different. How slightly? We're talking on the order of one nucleotide. So in a certain position, there is a GAG letter combo all in a row. But in people who are afflicted with sickle cell, the allele that they received has a T instead of the A. That one nucleotide switch is enough to code for a different amino acid and then a person is going to develop sickle cell anemia. GAG codes for glutamic acid. GTG codes for valine. So if we took a look at uh, this picture here, you can see the normal phenotype is on the top. Okay, We have the DNA of a normal cell, the mRNA that reads the DNA, and then how it gets translated at the ribosome with at this position right here, where we should have a glutamic acid, in a sickle cell patient, we're going to have the amino acid valine. And again, T is the normal uh, nucleotide, the, the, um, the nitrogenous base. It's going to code uh, as an A with the mRNA, and then with the tRNA that reads it eventually, there will be a U there, and that's going to code for glutamine. So down here we have valine and you can see we now have an A taking the position in the DNA that codes for U and at the ribosome we're then going to have a codon that's going to code for valine. Now what that will do if we look at the overall phenotype, uh, the overall way that our red blood cell looks, normal, red, biconcave disc, but in the case of hemoglobin that's built with valine, what we see is we see these long proteins and these long proteins are going to stretch out the shape of the red blood cell and have it become a sickle shell, a sickle cell elongated RBC. Now a little bit about red blood cells, they last for about four months typically in the bloodstream if they're normal, healthy, um, regular shaped cells. The fragile sickle cell shape though breaks down 10 to 20 days, and that's usually going to cause anemia. Anemia is the lack of iron in a person's blood. And one of the things that you'll find in normal red blood cell at the center of a hemoglobin molecule is an iron atom. And it's found what's called a heme group, and that's what allows us to bond oxygen. So with anemia, without that iron being present, there's going to be lower O2 saturation in a person's blood and they're all linked together. So if you don't have enough or a healthy supply of red blood cells, it's gonna affect the iron content of the red blood cells hemoglobin, and that's gonna affect the ability to bind to oxygen and deliver it to the rest of the body. So uh, people who are anemic are gonna feel weak and they'll tire more easily. Some symptoms that they'll exhibit are pain, high fever can result, spleen damage, compromised immunity, all of these different things can affect a patient who has sickle cell. So in other words, multiple phenotypic traits are affected by, in this case, an allele that codes for a protein that winds up misfolding in an organ, uh, red blood cell shape. Now, interestingly, one of the things that comes with sickle cell anemia, as bad as that sounds, is there's an added benefit for those that have it. And the strange thing is, if you are heterozygous for sickle cell anemia, you're going to have malaria resistance. Now, why? Well, if you remember, a 10 to 20 day lifespan on a red blood cell is enough to produce frequent turnover. And one of the things that uh, malaria is going to do is going to destroy red blood cells in the patients. So malaria is the number one killer on planet Earth because a lot of our population centers are in tropical regions. And what we're going to find out is that this disease stays around because of the benefit that it gives to those that carry it. So if you carry a gene that allows you to resist malaria, which is huge in this region here of Africa, and we have a region of South America that has a lot of tropical rainforest as well. It uh, holds a lot of population. And malaria is on the move. Right now we see it moving as climate changes to various regions as well that tend to be wet, swampy, and have a lot of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are what carries the uh, malaria and trans 
uh, transmits it to human um, recipients. So by having a sickle cell allele in a strange way, it adds a benefit to those that carry it because it allows them to survive um, malaria. Now, we see cases where one gene will often affect the outcome of another gene as well, very different from Mendel's laws. The idea is called epistasis, where a gene at one locus alters the phenotypic expression of a gene at a second locus. Okay, Now, in mice, the coat color of a mouse depends on two genes. One gene determines whether a mouse is going to be black, and one gene is going to determine, uh, I'm sorry, one allele will determine whether a mouse is black, and the other allele will determine whether the mouse is brown. Now, separately located along a chromosome is a gene C, and that's for color expression. So, as you can see, a capital C will code for that mouse getting the color that its other allele codes for. But if it receives a lowercase c combo, what we're going to see is that no color will be expressed. There'll be no pigment deposited on the hair. So how does that play out? Well, if we take a look at this Punnett square, where we have two F1 hybrids mating with each other, what we see is that we don't have a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Instead, we have a 9 to 3 to 4. Now, why? Well, let's go ahead and we'll complete the Punnett square. So here we have big B, big B, little c, little c. Here we have big B, little b, little c, little c. Again, big B, little b, little c, little c, and little b, little b, little c, little c. In each of the mice that have a brown or black coat, here you can see big C's in each one. Big C's, big C's, big C's, big C's, and that codes for color expression. But if something gets a double dose of the recessive genotype, uh, the, yes, the recessive genotype, lowercase c, lowercase c, it's going to code for no pigment added to the hair. So what we get is we get four albino mice out of this typical dihybrid cross. So instead of 9 to 3 to 3, 1, we get 9 to 3 to 4. Now, some traits gradually vary throughout a population. They're not one or another, and we call those quantitative characters. They vary in the population along a sliding scale continuum. So things that um, would, would be like that, for example, hair color, eye color, skin color, all of those things are not one thing or another. There tends to be a lot of graduation in both directions on um, how much is expressed. Quantitative variation usually indicates polygenic inheritance, an additive effect when two or more genes, of two or more genes on a single phenotype. So polygenic inheritance means multiple genes are affecting that particular phenotype. Um, we mentioned skin color is one, a very popular one that's looked at. So here you can see if we can imagine skin type being controlled by three genes, um, up at the top we have an F1 hybrid cross to produce, or sorry, tribrid cross, um, not dihybrid, tribrid, and, uh, oh, sorry, trihybrid, there we go, that's it, and we have three genes controlling um, skin color in each one of these offspring, and here's all the sperm across the top, here's all the eggs down this side, and you can see the extremes, if we look at their numbers and how they total out, are very low in number, because it was like that coin flip idea. What's the probability of me, uh, you know, flipping a coin six times and getting all heads? It's very low. It's one in 64. So in this case here, we're going to have a lot less at the extreme level and more in the middle level where the numbers kind of even out. So if we're talking skin color where this would be kind of stark white here and this would be very dark, most of the population is going to be wind up somewhere in the middle, the highest number being in the center. Now, Mendelian genetics do play a part in some human traits. However, we can't always study them as much as we want to actively because humans are not great subjects for genetic research. 
For example, our generation time is too long. Uh, for us to have a child typically takes about nine months, which means that the researchers are going to be waiting and waiting and waiting. Parents produce relatively few offspring. So if we're taking a look at, you know, um, rabbits or mice or anything else that reproduces a lot or fruit flies, humans are not even in the ballpark because they have relatively few offspring. Breeding experiments are unacceptable. Uh, this just kind of makes sense. If someone asks, hey, could we do a breeding experiment and you're going to play a part in it? Uh, most people are going to say uh, no. So um, that is going to lead to different ways that we have to study human traits for those Mendelian genetics. And that is through what we call a family tree or as we know it as a pedigree. So the way that a pedigree is looked at, uh, we can look at the key first here to kind of figure these things out. Males are squares, females are circles. And if the circle is or a square is shaded, that means they're affected with some condition. If there is a horizontal line between the two, that means that there was a mating event. The offspring will go from left to right, earliest to latest. So this uh, group here, if there was a line down from those two parents, they had a daughter and three sons, all who were unafflicted with whatever we were studying. In this cross here, what we're looking at is the um, trait, the phenotype of Widow's Peak. And Widow's Peak is, we mentioned it before, is when you have the front of the hairline dip down like that versus coming straight across like we see here. That's what we call a Widow's Peak. So we can take a look at uh, the grandparents, in this case, the first generation. We have an affected male, and we have a female who does not have widow's peak. And they have four children. They have a daughter here who does have a widow's peak, two sons who do not, and then the third son did. He reproduces with a woman who also has a widow's peak, and they have two children, two girls, this one here that does have the widow's peak and this one here who does not. So the question is, is a widow's peak dominant or recessive? And it doesn't take too much to figure out that the capital letter is present in all cases where we find the afflicted individual. So in this case here, it's going to be a dominant trait. We can look at a trait like attached versus free earlobes where in an attached earlobe, you kind of see this part here grow directly into the neck skin, where here you have more of a pronounced earlobe that's free hanging. And if we take a look at a pedigree chart, a family tree of who has it and who didn't, we can see that these two parents here had four children, and the two middle sons here both were affected, and um, in this case here had attached earlobes. These two grandparents over here the grandfather had attached earlobes. They had two girls. One girl had attached earlobes and one did not. The third son of those two grandparents and the first daughter of these two parents here, um, they made it together and one of the offspring had attached earlobes and one did not. So you can see in here, is the attached earlobe a dominant or recessive trait? By having parents that didn't have it and having kids that do, that tells you that it's going to be a recessive type of trait. Now, recessively inherited disorders show up in individuals homozygous for the allele. Now, we just saw traits and not necessarily alleles show up, but we did see uh, the case of a disease with sickle cell anemia, and that required, that was a recessively inherited disorder, and it took two of the recessive alleles in order to code for the trait. So carriers, then, we mentioned it earlier, are heterozygous individuals who carry the recessive allele but are phenotypically normal. So if we think back to the sickle cell parents, each one of those did carry an allele, but phenotypically they were normal. Here is a case where if we take a look at both normal parents, you can see that the parents are both coded heterozygously with a big A, little a combo. Now, segregation will allow the sperm to uh, get one big A, one little a, and segregation will allow the eggs to also have one big A, one little a. And it's going to code for three normal phenotype children. 
However, there is a chance that a child will receive a little a, little a combo. Now in this case here, this is uh, what we call albinism, where there's a lack of pigmentation in skin and hair, and you can see it in this little girl here. So in this case, a double A combo will lead to albinism in a child, and they had a 1-4 chance of that occurring. Now, if a recessive allele ca that causes a disease is rare, the chance of two people having that and meeting and mating is low. However, one thing that can keep that disease around in a given population is something called con consanguineous matings, and that's kind of what we refer to as inbreeding. And every once in a while, you'll have situations where something is kept in the population because there is some inbreeding going on. So in a case of one of these pedigree charts, we would look for a double line, which you see right here. And what we have is we have first cousins that have mated and produced three children. Two out of the three now carry the disease trait, uh, where this one would not. So um, in the last paragraph, most societies and cultures have laws or taboos against marriages between close relatives, and this is one of the reasons why. Okay, the next disease we'll look at is called cystic fibrosis, and this works a lot like the sickle cell allele, whereas uh, two people who are carriers have a chance of producing an offspring that would be affected, a one in four chance. Um, one of the things that we have people doing now more than ever is taking a look inside of their chromosomes, seeing what's there and seeing what they code for. Uh, there's a company called 23andMe where you scrape some cheek cells, you send them your sample, and they can come back to you with a whole list of things that may apply to you genetically. Cystic fibrosis is the most common lethal genetic disease in the U.S., striking one out of every 2,500 of people with European de uh, descent. Um, what causes it is the allele found in chromosome 7 is going to code for chloride transport channels being either faulty or absent. And what that's going to do is lead to the wrong concentration of chloride ions on one side of the membrane. So they'll fail to pass through ion channels they should. And what's going to happen because of that in terms of phenotype is that mucus buildup in the lungs and uh, intestines are going to block abnormal absorption and make the lungs less effective at oxygen exchange, uh, produce a lot of mucus that is very hard to get rid of, and it can, with a, a lot of mucus in there, it can harbor a lot of bacteria, which can then lead the patient to uh, possibly be infected more with things like pneumonia and lung diseases as well as the difficulty in absorbing nutrients in the small intestine. And unfortunately, this one here, um, it's very rare to live past 30 years old because these symptoms get so bad um, as you age with the chloride channels being faulty. Sometimes we have dominant, dominantly inherited disorders as well. Um, Dominant alleles that cause a lethal disease are rare and they typically arise by mutation. And those mutations happen in the sex cells. Now, if the mutation causes death before reproductive age, the allele will not be passed on to future generations. But there are some disorders that don't kick in until reproductive age has been met. Achondroplasia is a form of dwarfism caused by a rare dominant allele. So if we take a look at the parents, we can see that the big D is coding for the dwarf allele. And in this normal, pheno, uh, normal genotype, lowercase d, lowercase d, is, is codes for normal. So in the case of where we have a dwarf that mates with a normal phenotype individual, they have a 50-50 chance of having uh, ch children with dwarfism or achondroplasia versus uh, a normal height um, child. So um, in this case here, dominant trait produces half and half probabilities amongst the offspring. Huntington's disease is a serious and lethal disease that comes again from a dominant allele. So in this case here, the big D will represent that dominant allele. And of course, having this cross between big D, and we could say this lowercase n could be a lowercase d, and lowercase d, lowercase d, it's fine. This graphic just has it as a different letter. They use the n is for normal, d is for um, the Huntington's disease. So there's a 50-50 chance that it will pass on the 
big D to offspring, and a normal mother would carry both alleles for um, the lowercase n, so you have a 50%, two out of four chance of having children uh, that would also have the Huntington disease phenotype. Now, um, this is a very sad disease because usually without genetic counseling, without genetic testing, it's hard to know. And by the time you have children, it may you may find out after the fact that you do have Huntington's disease. Because as you can see, 35 to 45 is a uh, typical onset age. And by that time, a lot of people choose uh, to have children. And this affects about 1 in 10,000 in the United States. This particular gene is located on chromosome 4. We said it's a result of a dominant allele. And this gene will remain and intends to remain because the onset of the disease is after reproductive age. Today, with, with new ways to genetically counsel, with um, uh, companies like 23andMe, where you scrape your cheek cells, you send in a sample, and then they send you back a whole laundry list of, of genes and things that you may or may not code for, it's easier to find out if you have serious uh, diseases in your future. But that also kind of uh, meddles in the ethics and biology. Do you want to know this information, or would you rather just kind of wait and see what life has to offer and to bring you later? So everybody's different. Everyone has their own opinions on that, but it's a, it's a kind of one of those exploding issues that people are now doing and talking about. This is what a brain looks like of a person who um, likely died of Huntington's disease. This is a normal brain sitting underneath it. And you can see there's not a whole lot of empty space. Uh, most spaces are full. Whereas the Huntington's brain, if you take a look at these ventricles, these cavities are enormous. There's a lot of space in places where there shouldn't be space. So it's a deterioration of brain tissue over time um, after the disease kicks in. We mentioned genetic counseling, genetic testing. There's a couple of ways to do it. Um, for a developing offspring within a mother. First way is called amniocentesis. The amnion is the liquid that bathes the fetus and that's going to be removed and tested. You can do that about 14 to 16 weeks into the pregnancy. The second type is called chorionic villa sampling, CVS, and with that, a sample of the placenta or the chorion is removed and tested. You can do that a bit earlier from about weeks eight through 10 of a pregnancy. Other techniques such as ultrasound and fetoscopy allow fetal health to be assessed visually in utero. So you can, uh, there's no, no complications, no risk doing an ultrasound, just kind of look at picture inside of a fluid filled cavity, very safe. Let's take a look at the first two though and see how that works. So with amniotic fluid, you can see that there is a syringe that is penetrating uh, the belly here and what it's going to do it's going to suck out some of this amniotic fluid that amniotic fluid will contain cells from the fetus that have been sloughed off what we can then do is we can then grow those cells on a culture plate and we can after a few weeks we can take a look at the chromosomes to make sure um, all the chromosomes look right we can look for certain genes being present on those chromosomes as well and we can take a look extract some of the fluid from the anionic fluid and do biochemical tests on it. So that's one of the ways to look at um, the po potential phenotype of a developing uh, fetus the other strategy for looking at the potential phenotypes of a developing fetus is by chorionic villi sampling. So as you can see here, um, after a cell has implanted inside of the mother's uterus, it starts to develop. And one of the things that develops is the placenta. We've all heard that one before. And from that placental area, we have what's called chorionic villi. And what we do is we sample a little bit of that chorionic villi here, which contains fetal cells, and again, we can culture those cells and take a look at the karyotype and then uh, take a look at the chromosomes and analyze the chromosomes for potential um, concerns. We can also take a look at and do biochemical tests on the fluid that um, is, comes out with the chorionic sample and take a look at that for potential uh, phenotypic outcomes later in life. So we've covered a lot with the second half of our talk on genetics. Uh, bottom line is Mendelian genetics, as simple as they are, as much as we like doing monohybrid, uh, dihybrid crosses, unfortunately, 
in nature things are a lot more complicated and there's a lot of cases and a lot of different species that differ and they will not follow the rules of Mendel's laws that he was able to come up with based on the pea plant. So I hope you learned a lot. Uh, keep reading that book. Keep doing those questions. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.